I'm going to share my five best anxiety fighting tips. Now, keep in mind, this is not medical advice. I'm obviously not a doctor. I'm just someone who's been dealing with these issues since I was a small child. These are tips that help me. If you have a medical problem, if you have anxiety disorders that prevent you from living a normal life, from working, having normal relationships, anything like that, please see a doctor if you can. You may need medication. I take medication. But these are just habits that tend to make it better for me. If they don't work for you, that's fine. Um, they should not be harmful at the very least. But most of what I'm saying is not controversial. I'm not going to offer you snake oil. There's nothing weird here. First tip, remember that your brain is part of your body. And I know this sounds like a bumper sticker or something, but almost everybody I know with these problems underestimates this. For example, you all probably, if you are an anxious person or suffer from anxiety, you probably have trouble sleeping at night because, of course, you know, you can't turn off your brain when you go to bed. What is less obvious is that your lack of sleep is often causing your anxiety the next day. It, it's a cycle because basically, if you've heard someone say, well, I'm sorry I got really mad at you earlier, um, but I'm in a bad mood because I didn't sleep last night. Think about what they're implying. They're saying that their lack of sleep prevented their brain from properly controlling their emotion, that their ability to keep an even keel, to regulate their emotion, to regulate their anger was depleted by the lack of sleep, right? So it only stands to reason that the same lack of sleep also robs you of your ability to regulate your anxiety. It robs you of your ability to keep things in perspective and to kind of function like a normal person. So it becomes a cycle where you're not sleeping because you're anxious and then you're anxious because you're not sleeping. I know that that may seem like it's unhelpful because you just said that your anxiety makes it hard for you to sleep. But what I am saying is if you can't attack the problem with the goal of getting more sleep, of going to bed earlier, getting medication for that, doing whatever you have to do, you may find out that suddenly your anxiety is improved. And that is as simple as you feel better the next day, you have more energy and therefore you have more ability to fight the intrusive thoughts or whatever that kind of make anxiety what it is, which is this feeling that like you're just buzzing all the time with a vague fear that something terrible is going to happen or that the world is going to hell. Likewise, it's probably very annoying to have someone say to you, well, all you need to do is get out and get some exercise or and stop eating the junk food, you know, start eating salads and exercising because that's like the knee jerk advice for every single thing. And fit, healthy people love to tell the rest of us how to live. But scientifically, that, that does work. It's for the same reason. For me, when I'm feeling anxious or depressed, and there's heavy overlap between anxiety and depression. I think something like half the people with an anxiety disorder also have a depressive disorder. It's, they're kind of come in the same package in many cases. But people like me, when I'm feeling down or feeling anxious, I gravitate toward junk food, stuff that has a lot of sugar and fat because it makes me feel better while I'm eating it. But again, something like that that messes with your blood sugar, where a couple of hours later in the afternoon, you're suddenly sleepy and you're feeling like crap and you're having trouble concentrating because you're, you put like the wrong nutrients in your body. It's the same thing with the lack of sleep. You've jacked up your body's ability to deal with it. Um, and likewise, exercise helps it just, they don't know exactly why, like what the mechanism is. But there are some people that get better benefits from exercise than from medication, uh, especially for, I think, mild anxiety. It may be as simple as taking your mind off of it um, because you're jogging or you're walking or you're doing something like it's just, you know, it kind of get, forces your brain to focus on other things in doing the exercise. Um, and as far as I understand, like any kind of a repetitive motion even something uh, like gardening, something like that, that's kind of a mindless task can help. And I think it's just because it puts, it forces the brain to shift into a different mode um, and devote resources elsewhere. I don't know the mechanics of it. I just know that those things, sleep, diet, exercise, probably as effective as almost any other steps you can take. So 
again, I understand how frustrating that is to hear because if you're depressed, exercising is the last thing you feel like doing. But if you, you can think of it in terms of finding something that you enjoy, even if it's just walking or something, you would be surprised by, at how well that works, especially if you build a, a habit out of it. Tip number two, fake snake oil cures actually do work to a degree and there's a reason for this things on the market that you see on the shelf at grocery stores these days or at like whole foods where it's not the actual medicine section but it's a section where they've got all the herbs and the supplements and the cbd oil in many cases depends on what store you're at it's very frustrating because i there's no scientific evidence that a lot of that works um, or there may be very limited evidence it's very hard to measure because when you're talking about something like a broken bone, they know whether or not that's been cured. They can look at it on an x-ray and say, well, the bone's not sticking out of his arm anymore. With something like anxiety or depression or anything like that, you're basically asking the person, how do you feel? Do you feel less anxious? And so when they do an experiment where they will give you something that is effectively just a placebo, um, whether it's, I think CBD is just a placebo or it's some, you know, St. John's wort or some other herb, you will have a certain percentage of people saying, yeah, I feel better. It's not fully understood why placebos work so well. I personally think that it's just the act of taking some kind of an action to fight the, the anxiety or whatever puts you in a different mindset, whether you took a, 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 a supplement or a pill or drank some anxiety fighting tea that your hippie friend gave you, it kind of doesn't matter that in every case, the fact that you took positive action to, to attacking the anxiety to where the thought you're having in your brain, instead of the world was coming to an end and everyone hates me, having the thought I am experiencing anxiety as a condition, like an illness, and I need to fight it. And then taking some action to doing it automatically puts you into a different mindset. And honestly, even if you know what you're taking as a placebo, it can still work. I, I think that things like meditation, um, you know, yoga, any of those things, a lot of them, that's all it is. It's just that you made the decision to do something to fight your anxiety. You recognized it as an, as like an external threat that you can take on and got yourself out of the anxiety mindset because now you have like, like a positive mindset of I'm going to try to fight this thing. That said, if the thing you're taking, one, costs a bunch of money, or two actually does have some effects. For example, a lot of you out there are self-medicating anxiety with, with weed, with marijuana. Just be careful because if you're taking something that's real or something that's expensive, there it's a very easy to wind up in a situation where someone is taking advantage of you. If you are self-medicating with alcohol, it's obvious what the danger is because alcohol is obviously very, very addictive. That's why alcoholism is a thing. That's why alcoholism kills millions of people around the world. A lot of those people that are drinking, they're drinking to self-medicate anxiety. Anxiety is the plague of modern life. So that would be the one thing here is that almost any treatment for anxiety can work because the placebo effect is so strong and just the positive action effect in my belief is very strong. But when you're picking what you're taking, you have to be very selective because if you're taking something that is addictive or has side effects or it costs $500 a bottle, obviously then you can be in a situation where somebody's trying to profit off of your mental illness. Tip number three, if your anxiety is tied to a specific activity or situation, just exposure to that thing can help. I'm specifically talking mostly here about social anxiety, which is one of the most common forms. This is a thing where I believe a lot of people who've never talked to a doctor about it tend to self-diagnose social anxiety because it's like, well, if I go to a party, I get very nervous because I'm surrounded by all these people. I'm worried about making a you know, good impression on them. But I 
think what you have to understand is that the reason why it is almost automatic that everyone starts drinking as soon as they arrive at a party is because they're all anxious. It, you know, alcohol basically makes parties possible in the modern world. And that is because you should be anxious. It's a high stakes situation. You've got like a bunch of people there. You're trying to impress them. You don't want them to make fun of you. You're trying to make friends. You could potentially be meeting, you know, new friends or partners or, or whatever. Yeah, that's something to be nervous about. It's it's like a job interview, you know, that's it's not you don't have a disorder if you're nervous going into a job interview. You're that's reasonable. It's it's high stakes. You need to be alert and focused in, in trying to uh, be your best self and there's a lot to worry about your presentation the way you're talking the jokes you're telling you know everything you do is being judged it's you know it's not a, a phobia some of the people at the party who don't seem to be anxious in many cases are just too oblivious because they don't think at all about what people you know think about them or how they come off and that's the only reason they're not nervous is because they're not thinking about it but a lot of the people who are able to go out and socialize, even in what seems like very high stakes situations with tons of people among where almost everyone is a stranger, the reason a lot of them are able to do it and not, you know, collapse into a ball of nervousness is just due to practice. Practice scientifically does make social anxiety better because you've been exposed to these situations enough times and you realize that some of what you're afraid of is not real. Most of social anxiety and even agoraphobia, my understanding is that it is basically an extreme phobia of embarrassment. It is fear of embarrassment where you would rather die than embarrass yourself in public. But one thing they will have you do like in therapy for these things is go out you know, on the subway and like sing in public or, or do something that gets you out of your comfort zone just to help you see that you're not going to die if you do something embarrassing because honestly nobody cares about you nobody cares it's it's a liberating thought to realize how much strangers do not care whether or not you do something embarrassing your friends when you do something embarrassing it makes them like you more because it makes you seem more approachable it makes it seem like hey we're all human they're not intimidated to be around you getting over that I think is something you just have to be exposed to enough times that you sort of realize, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of, just like every other activity on earth. If you're scared of swimming, if you swim several hundred times, the fear is probably going to go away. Obviously, this advice, like everything on this video, is not going to work for everybody. I understand some people have much more severe cases than others. I understand some people are afraid of those situations for a reason or a different reason, or they have trauma, something like that. That's fine. I'm just saying in many cases, including mine, it helped a lot just to have some exposure and repeated exposure made it better over time. Part of the issue with anxiety is that when you are sort of trapped in your own head and you let your own fears kind of run wild, that usually is worse than the actual thing as it exists in reality because you get into a loop where your brain is just feeding off of this fear of you imagining different like bad scenarios that could occur. And you can kind of just tie yourself up until it just fries those circuits. Actually going out and being exposed to the real thing and forming real memories of actually doing it kind of replaces the bad fantasy with an, and a reality of you actually having done it. That's all. Tip number four. Find something that you have some control over and go control it. And here, this is where we start talking about doing like simple activities uh, like mowing the lawn or cleaning the house or something like that where you can actually do it and see some effect from doing it. The reason why this works, and again, I realize this sounds like a lame tip that somebody made up just because they wanted you to clean your house, but the brain science behind it, as it was explained to me, is that the issue with modern anxiety is that humans evolved to have these mechanisms in the brain to save us from danger. So if you're being chased by a bear or a saber-toothed tiger or another caveman, you have this fight or flight response that kicks in and floods your bloodstream with adrenaline and all these hormones that you know tighten up your muscles and make you be able to run faster or fight harder. Uh, you know, it focuses your attention so you can like think faster and make quick decisions. And 
all of these things are built in and the idea is that you can use this reflex to then escape and get out of danger by by killing the tiger or or running away from the bear or whatever and then here's the key once you've escaped the danger you then return to normal and you get this reward where your your, your body kind of slows down and you calm down and you've done it you have you have escaped you have beaten death Modern society and the culture has evolved much faster than your body has. So we are now in a society where in order to function as an everyday adult or even a child, you are constantly in a state of low level danger. It's usually non-lethal. You're not being chased by a tiger, but you constantly have to worry about paying your bills, you know, performing at your job, maintaining your marriage, your friendships. Uh, the guy you're arguing with on, on Instagram or whatever, all of these million little dangers that are constantly there. And so you're always in this slightly heightened state of fight or flight and you never get to relax because that, that period where you have escaped the tiger and now you can calm down never comes because there's always another bill. There's always another day at work. And the modern world, and I'm talking about the modern world right now in 2020, social media, the news media, everything has maximized kind of using anxiety as a way to earn profit and ways to kind of keep you in a state of anxiety because the way it works is you're monitoring social media to see how the election is going or something else. And the signal is, the only way to cure your anxiety is to keep refreshing this app or to keep scrolling on your phone or to keep logging back into Twitter or watching the trending topics or doing whatever that they're making you anxious and then selling you the cure for the anxiety that does not work because going on Twitter or any place else on the internet and endlessly monitoring some terrible situation, you know, the, the protests, or you know something Trump is doing, or some new scandal, or some new danger with the pandemic, or you know, all, every day there's some other food that is killing you, something like that, or global warming, or or nuclear war, or some other looming threat. Endlessly scrolling news about that thing does not fix that thing, and it does not fix your anxiety toward that thing because knowing more about it doesn't help you, and also you are powerless to affect that situation. So the very mechanism that is supposed to be working here, where your body heightens its awareness so you can escape the danger, now doesn't work because you can't escape that danger. You can't escape the election. You can't escape global warming. Those things are just all around you. So everything that they're telling you to do, when I say they, I mean the media and everyone else who's trying to sell you solutions to this, are not gonna fix the problem because ultimately they want to keep you in a state of anxiety because they make more money off of it because it's your anxiety that keeps you just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling on your phone. And you can look at the headlines where they're demanding that you be afraid or demanding you be outraged, you know, horrifying new news about this thing. Or if this story about Trump doesn't enrage you, nothing will. Like they're promising that they're going to upset you and their goal is to kind of keep you in that state all the time. So the things that you will probably find therapeutic are where you can turn that off. And if you go outside and I don't know, mow your lawn, if you have a lawn or clean up, clean your closet, when you've done it, the cleaning, you now have a cleaner closet. If you've mowed the lawn, you now have shorter grass. In other words, you have found a situation that you can actually control and you have controlled it. You have affected the world in a way that you cannot affect all of that stuff that's making you anxious. In my experience, this is not medical advice, in my experience, when you're trying to find the things gonna distract yourself, there's a huge gap between things that you feel good about afterward and things that you feel bad about afterward. And if you do something that's kind of productive, weeding a garden or cleaning out your gutter or something, something that you can see the result of, raking some leaves. If you, I know a lot of this is lawn-based. If you don't have a lawn, find something that you can do. Go out in the park and pick up some trash. I don't even care if it actually helps anybody. 
It's just that if you sit down and play a game for 19 straight hours in order to escape from the world, for me, because I've certainly done that, for me, when you turn the game off, there's this come down period that tends to trigger the depression because it's like, well, that's a day wasted. Like all of the problems are still out there. Like what, what, good, what good did that do? Whereas if instead, you, if your repetitive mindless task is, I don't know, bathing your dog or something, where at the end of it, it looks different than when you started, you know, or if you decide to paint your room, I don't know, it's something where at the end of it, you've done something. The room's now a different color. Congratulations. For me, whatever feel good chemicals coming out of your brain from doing repetitive tasks, they're better and more lasting when it's something that had some sort of a tangible effect versus something like playing a video game or whatever that um, it's just kind of like you just detached for a while and then you come back and the world's still waiting for you. Like it's true, painting your room a different color is not going to fix global warming, but it did make your room a different color. And I'm telling you, that helps. A lot of people, that helps a lot because you feel useful, which ties into a previous video I've done. And I think that your brain feeds you pleasure chemicals when you do something that seems productive or useful or, or good, that you just take pride in it. Fifth and final tip, be open to try things. When I'm feeling anxious or when I'm feeling depressed or I'm generally just physically not feeling well, you can't tell me anything. Any suggestions you give me, any advice you give me, it comes off like you think you know better than me or like you think you're an expert when your own life is a mess. I am not receptive to help of any kind. That is actually one of the biggest obstacles to getting help for this kind of thing is that it's anxiety tells you that the whole world is rotten and that everything is broken and so all of the advice you get, well, this person's probably just a phony or they're probably just trying to make money off me or whatever. I'm here to tell you that a lot of the things that help are the old kind of boring advice that you've probably heard a thousand times and are probably rejected a thousand times. And just having a mindset of, I'm going to try anything to fix this where instead of just saying the thing that I tell myself when I'm at my lowest, which is that, well, of course I'm depressed, everything is a nightmare, or of course I'm anxious, everything is falling apart in the world, to get out of that mindset and realize, look, whatever is happening to the world, me being so anxious that I'm literally in a state of inaction, like I can't do my own work and attend to my own relationships because of my anxiety, that's not going to fix it. You know, in order to live and function in a dangerous world, I have to be at peak performance. And if the anxiety or the depression or whatever causes me to be planted on a sofa and just scrolling on my phone for five, six, seven straight hours, that is bad. That is objectively bad. And that the condition, the state of mind, the illness, whatever you want to call it, that puts me in that situation where it has me planted on the sofa as if I'm, I'm sick, I've got to treat that as an illness that has to be addressed. And if I can't cure it, at least treating the symptoms or making it not as bad, but basically saying that I have a goal to reduce this and to fix this. And even that right there, if I were in a different mood, would enrage me because it's like, oh, you're implying I don't want to get better. You're implying I like being like this. You're implying that, that I'm like this because you know you're, you're victim blaming. You're you know you're acting like it's my own fault, and it's nobody's fault other than the world being like it is. But it is your responsibility in the sense that there's no one else that can do it for you. If you don't go seek medical help if you need it, if you don't try different techniques, different lifestyle changes, no one can force you. They can't. Not in this world. Nobody's going to put a gun to your head and say, hey, you need to get 30 minutes of exercise a day. Or you need to get out into the sun because they claim that sunlight and vitamin D can improve your mood maybe. Like, 
telling you, you know, we're going to force you to eat a healthy diet or we're going to force you to get a certain amount of exercise. Or we're going to force you to talk through your problems with someone. That's not going to happen. Only you can do that. Only you can follow through with it. The Lord knows, I, you know, I can't make my anxiety just go away, but I can change my habits so that I'm still able to get work done, still able to treat other people well. And it takes work to do that. But I have to wake up every day saying, this is my thing I've got to work on. This is my thing. Other people have different things. You know, I'm not a drug addict. Other people have addictions. That's their thing. Um, you know, everybody's got something, a flaw. There's something in their body that doesn't work quite right. For me, probably you, hundreds of millions of other people, the issue is that we struggle handling anxiety and it wants to eat up all of our energy and kind of make us ineffective as people. So that's, that's all. Be open to the idea that this is something that you can probably affect to some degree or other and it's something that you should try to affect to some degree or other. I hope this helped. If you know somebody you think would be helped by it, send them the link or share, share it with them on social media or whatever. Um, thank you very much. Stay safe out there and have a nice day. Imagine a future where superpowers are possible, but everyone's just too dumb to use them. Welcome to my world. Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick by David Wong is a new novel that Publishers Weekly calls a brilliant modern parable disguised as pop fiction. Order it at futuristicviolence.com.